we ready? Are we ready to kick off down the back? Thank you. Kia ora, kia ora kato. Uh, no my hairi mai, no my hoki mai. Welcome back to the final session of today. My name is David Wright, and I'm the kai kaitohu of the uh, Navy Museum located in Tamaki Makoro in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's my privilege to be able to introduce the two papers we have in this session. The first is on the materiality of the Great Escape over the Baltic Sea, pre uh, pre presented by Anna Arnberg and Maria Arnslaff. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just cannot get my head around that name. I'm terribly sorry. Um, well, the second, the Kuprianov collection is presented by Ursula Vanka. We're very tight on time, so we're going to leave the questions until the end, if we have time. Alternatively, please uh, get in touch with the speakers and ask them any questions that you might have. But as, uh, as Kim has said, we need to get out fairly quickly after 14.30. So can I invite Anna and Maria up to present? Uh, Thank you, David, uh, for the presentation, and thank you, ICMM, for letting us uh, do this uh, speech here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it because this has been a project, uh, a research pro project, that has been really great to be a part of. Uh, it's a research pro uh, project that we have called the Materiality of the Great Escape over the Baltic Sea. And uh, the topic is the escape from the Baltic countries to Sweden during the Second World War. Uh, I have been a project manager uh, in this project and Mirja Ancho, who is uh, standing here beside me, has been a researcher in the same project. And uh, we both uh, work at a maritime museum in Sweden uh, and we have uh, done this project as part of, uh, of that work and uh, the maritime museum uh, was opened in 1938. It's a museum with great collections, uh, a lot of ship models, paintings, photographies, uh, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Uh, today, we st uh, instead are going to talk about uh, a lack of, of uh, material or a knowledge gap at the museum and how we have tried to uh, work around it and create a material as part of this uh, research project. Uh, uh, we are uh, going to start to give you a short background, both through the project, uh, but also to the historical background and the setting that we have been uh, exploring in this project. We're also going to speak uh, some about our aims and methods, and then also about the theory of the project and a bit also about the results. But uh, I think we're going to start about, what is it, five years ago? 2017 uh, on the island of Gotland in the middle of the Baltic Sea and uh, a trip that you made there. Yes, um, and just by chance I happened to come across, uh, I caught sight on this, um, this little boat as you can see, uh, and to me it looked very um, uh, foreign in a way. I could tell it wasn't uh, locally built but it looked like it had been coming from Eastern Europe somewhere and that I found uh, quite um, um, interesting because it's quite a distance to, to cross the Baltic and this boat isn't very big. So I started to, to um, ask around a little bit and eventually I found out from, uh, that, that this boat was found in the winter of 1944 uh, close by, and uh, the, the fishermen who found it, they, they found that it had capsized during the crossing, so they brought it ashore and they concluded that it, this must be in one of the refugee boats that uh, were, were very frequent in this area during this particular period of time. Uh, and when I, when I learned this, it was uh, mind-blowing to me because um, 
I've never heard about uh, Baltic escape boats in Sweden, and uh, they, they didn't, they weren't listed at all. They didn't form part of uh, the authorized heritage. Uh, so that's uh, how it started. Yes, and the, the reason that this boat um, came to, to this island of Gotland that you can see in the middle of the picture, it has to do with the, the Second World War, because um, the Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia were occupied. Uh, they were, at the beginning of the war, there were three sovereign neutral states, but they were occupied three times, first by the Soviet Union and then by Nazi Germany and then once again by the Soviet Union. And this triggered uh, an escape towards Sweden, which was a neutral country. And uh, as the front approached uh, in, in the, the autumn of 1944, this escape, escape turned large scale, really. So you can see here how people traveled, and um, then some of them actually a few years later traveled on um, to the uh, to, uh, United States, Canada, other places. And yeah, there were about 30, 35,000 people that, that came to Sweden, about uh, people. And here's a picture just uh, to show you what it looked like in Tallinn in those days when most people fled in the autumn of 1944. And um, what the boats looked like. There were many small boats, uh, often very crowded. Uh, and then at arrival, the people were sent to different camps and then later on sent, to, to, sent off to work in different areas in Sweden. And meanwhile, the boats were like still on the arrival uh, sites and they were, they were uh, brought together by the Swedish authorities to, to certain areas uh, and detained there. And then later on, the, the Soviet uh, regime claimed ownership of these boats and they were repatriated in 1945, more or less every one of them, not, not all of them as, as you know already, but most of them. And uh, you can see also a picture of um, the steamship that you can see, that's the walnut that actually made it to, um, to this Pier 21 in a few years afterwards with some 350 people uh, on board. And then when uh, you got back from Gotland, from this small fishing village, having looked at that, uh, found that boat, uh, we were uh, colleagues sitting in the rooms next to each other and Mirja told me that story and we thought it was both fascinating. So we started to think about what we as a maritime museum could do on this topic, and we also gathered uh, some of our colleagues, uh, curators, uh, uh, educational officers, and so on, to just have a look uh, at it from different perspectives. Uh, but we quite soon come to the conclusion that it was almost impossible for us to do something at that stage, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, we had too, too little material to work with. Uh, this document that you see on the screen uh, was one of the few that we found in our archives telling about this story. So instead of doing something like an exhibition or, or uh, educational uh, things, we started to think about a research project and how we as researchers could work with this and creating a material. And for us, it became important uh, that we had to do add material to our own collections. We have been working a lot with photography and with interviews, interviewing people who, who fled during this time. We also needed to do research on this material to create new knowledge. And then at the end, we also needed to find ways to uh, convey this uh, history to a broader public and in the first project, uh, or in the project that we have been uh, uh, working with for the last three years, one of the main goals was to create a, a popular book, the one you can see, the more greenish one on the right. Uh, 
using this material and these interviews. On the left, you can see Miria's thesis, because during the same time, you also uh, finished your thesis at Stockholm University. So we have had two sister projects dealing with the same topic. Yes, and, and uh, being archaeologists, we <laughs> were interested in the materiality of the escape, and we thought that we would uh, contribute to research by looking into how um, things, material things and material culture related to history and how that could sort of unfold history in a slightly different way. So we could learn things that weren't in to be found in the archives and so on. And we, so we worked with object elicitation and with object biographies. We looked into the life history of other things and explored what they had been through. Uh, and the, it, it turns out these uh, objects, like the boats, they hold a lot of information actually. Uh, like this one, you can see it has been repaired. Uh, there are those small plates all over the hull. Uh, this boat was, um, it was uh, deliberately destroyed by gunfire when the Soviet uh, army um, pulled back in, nine, nine, in yeah. And then um, afterwards it, uh, is it oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but still, it, it, it's a very small boat, but it, it, um, 13 people made an escape with it anyway, and then it, it was just left to deteriorate on, on the shore. So I think it says a lot about how, how motivated people were to actually try, give it a try to make, to make it to Sweden. Uh, and this boat, uh, it has been uh, penetrated by, by some um, projectile through the hull, so it... The boats were actually shot at during the crossing, so it was a very dangerous uh, trip. And uh, the, those boats, they form um, like traces in the landscape today. They tell also about where many people used to arrive in certain coastal areas. You find the traces on the shores, like this one. And they also um, reflect where people later on settled down they, and used these boats for making a living by fishing, herring and stuff. And uh, you can also tell that it must have been very difficult approaching a foreign shore, rocky sh shore like Sweden. Uh, some of the boats stranded. They couldn't decide on, it, it might have been very dark. They, maybe they came here by night. So. And those boats, they look very empty today, but uh, you have to remember that in, during um, those days, there were, most of them were really f filled up with people and, and the belongings that the people brought with them. And oft, I, I felt that uh, there was a need to also uh, research those things and see what people had, uh, had decided or, or managed to get to, to bring with them. Uh, it, yeah, that picture that you just saw, it was, it was drawn by a, a girl who was eight year, years old during the escape. So we've been interviewing people and telling them uh, that have still kept things that they had brought during the crossing. And sometimes it's a lot of things, but sometimes it's just a few things. But generally people have, have really cared for those subjects and kept them in, in their homes. And by, by paying interest in those subjects, you get a slightly different understandings of, of why they were brought and so on. And uh, also, since those people are old today, you get like a, a children's, a kid's perspective on the escape and how they experienced those things. Yeah. And uh, I think we documented like 350 different objects and they also, they reflect what life was like during the occupation, like lots of permissions to go fishing or to, to use a ferry or something like that kids that uh, were living in, in the cities and that had to go stay with their grandparents on the countryside because of the bombing. A lot of things that were suddenly uh, uh, dangerous to have in your home, like books and stuff. And also you find a lot of things that obviously that, that you need to, to make this crossing equipment that were used in the boats and so on and so on but also um, things that we're not really used to from a maritime, in the maritime museum, like those teddy bears and sewing machines, lots of sewing machines actually, 
that uh, speaks about uh, how people were preparing to, to make a living afterwards and also that they really uh, cared for the kids and to, to try to keep them calm and safe so during the crossing. So there are lot, lots of material culture related to, to children. And all, all of those items, they have been, by time, they become very precious for, for the memories they hold. So people keep them in, in their homes and uh, we have not wanted to, to collect them to the museum be, because they're so important for families, for family history, so we just taken photos of them. Uh, we have collected a few things, but not much at all. Uh, as I said, we have been, uh, this has been a project that's been ongoing for three years, and during this time, we have encountered a lot of new people, new stories. Uh, we ourselves, and as a museum, has got very much new knowledge. We have completely new networks. Uh, we have different perspective, not least the child perspective, that we didn't have as much before. Uh, and all of this has made us uh, a more, I think, uh, mature organization when it comes to this topic, but it's also given us completely different possibilities to do something uh, that, that we had before. And uh, it, this wasn't obvious from the start that it was going to be an exhibition. As I said, we met uh, curators and so on in the beginning, and one of the things they said was that we had too little material. But when we look back, uh, sometime during this project, they also uh, uh, were able to think in this direction, and well, next week or so, we, we're going to open an exhibition at the Maritime Museum dealing with this topic. Yes, and just to conclude, to wrap it up, uh, we're back at this um, um, fishing cottage, Gotland. It's the, the boat that sort of triggered this whole process. And I just want to show you how it has been really... Um, well, this is, was what it looked like in uh, 2018. Um, yeah, and the, after the winter, it looked like this, so it's disintegrating. Uh, another year went by and it looked like this. And now we're um, present this winter. Um, so it's not very much left of this boat. So I'm really happy that it sort of passed on its history before, uh, before it, uh, this, it started to de decay like this. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you for... <laughs>